Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. As, as Adrian said, my name is Alexi. I work at Google in the Google Cloud. And, and today, it's not about Google Cloud specifically, but it's about the lessons we've learned at Google running a number of services at scale, how much of that uh, is uh, documented today, uh, and how much of that is also available um, through uh, things we've externalized as tools to help you operate in a serverless world. So it all starts with serverless. And that's kind of a funny word. Every, I think everybody agrees, first of all, because it defines something by what, why, what it's not. Uh, everybody knows there are servers. Um, I'm not going to make that joke, but it's not a really good term. And people are like, are you talking about functions as a service? People are talking about databases that are serverless uh, as well. Um, all of these may or may not fit the serverless uh, definition. So it's not a really good term. So let, let me suggest another one. Um, who thinks no ops is a better term? Anybody? Uh, it could be, because when you think of it, serverless is about not you know, uh, managing the servers. Of course you have servers. You just operate at a higher level of abstraction. Uh, turns out this is a really bad idea. Like no ops means that you know, if, if you think no ops is a good term, uh, you probably don't understand ops, generally speaking, and, and DevOps in, in particular. It's all about you know, offering services. And you, know, you might be based on serverless infrastructure. You're still offering services. So you still need to manage those and deliver those services to, to their users. So I don't have a solution for you. I don't have a better term. I'm not trying to start a new uh, hashtag uh, trending. Uh, what I do have is a few best practices that we've developed at Google and that we're trying to share with the world. Uh, through uh, you know, documentation, uh, books, but also through some of the tools in, in our cloud offering. Uh, so obviously, there are a number of challenges when it comes to monitoring serverless infrastructure. So let me go through a few of them. So first of all, the servers are there. Uh, they're somewhere in a data center, uh, but they're not accessible, meaning that there's no SSHing into a machine, like certainly not to change anything there and to create a snowflake. Uh, if you do have SSH access, that's, that might happen. Uh, it's usually just to look at things. But consider you don't have SSH access, and that's a good thing. Um, you also cannot install an agent of your choice. You, know, you cannot install your favorite uh, monitoring agent. That probably is not an option in most serverless offering. Um, Auto-scaling is the name of the game. That's the reason why um, cloud works, and the economics of cloud work is that you are able to bin pack a lot of uh, workloads on a small number of machine and um, don't pay for uh, resources, you, resources you don't use. So if you scale to zero, your bill scales to zero. Um, but that also means that instances come and go. And you cannot rely on the fact that between two successive calls, part of the same you know, uh, session in, in terms of uh, uh, the application itself, that you will go back to that same instance. You cannot assume that. In fact, you should never assume that. Uh, so that means you know, you, you're trying to monitor something where everything changes, keeps going up and down all the time, trying to adjust to the best utilization possible because that's what we try to do in cloud, certainly. Um, the other thing is oftentimes serverless and functions in particular are used to implement microservices, where you do one thing, you do it really well, and it has dependencies on other services. You might scale services differently, independently. Each one has different uh, versions, uh, which means you, know, you had one big monolith, and now you have lots of different services, so lots of things going on, uh, lots of calls being made. Um, and lots of possibilities for failure. So this makes the uh, serverless, and certainly in this case the microservices uh, environment, somewhat more challenging to, to manage. Uh, and of course, there's the event side of things. Mostly in a serverless world, we talk about events triggering um, a compute uh, actions through you know, functions. So uh, a file being up to, uploaded to a bucket, a, po um, a message being posted to a queue, all of these things are typical events that are, you react to, and this is when you trigger uh, something. So the whole asynchronous nature of the architectures that are being put in place in serverless um, also bring uh, an additional layer of challenge when it comes to trying to understand how did we end up in this state? You know, uh, what triggered this, this problem that we're seeing now?
So let me share with you quickly uh, a, a, a demo. Uh, you're encouraged to, to use this. This is a demo that um, is a very simple photo sharing site. It's called Pick a Daily. Uh, it's a really smart name. Uh, so uh, basically, you can use uh, this thing on a desktop, on your phone. It's a PWA, a progressive web app. So hopefully that should work on all devices. Uh, and what it does is as you upload a picture, it will use the Google Vision API, one of the machine learning APIs that we offer, to extract a number of tags about what it sees in the photo. Uh, this will help us compute the most popular tags. Um, and because I don't exactly trust all of you, uh, I do have an admin feature where I can filter things out. Because the API will actually flag some things as not being OK to show on a screen like this one or to anyone in general. So and for anything user generated, uh, we can flag things as being violent, uh, racy, or otherwise um, not safe from work. Uh, so very quickly, the architecture uses multiple modules that will take care of the front end, uh, take care of uh, making the right API calls, uh, trigger functions when things are being uploaded to buckets, uh, the metadata is being stored in a NoSQL database, and there's a whole event-driven logic where typically when something's uploaded to a bucket, we trigger a function which makes the call to this machine learning API, um, updates some data, and we also have another type of event which is cron as a service. You know, hooray, we, we, we have something that's quite nice where you can, on a regular basis, make calls. And in this case, it's to compute the most popular tag because we consider this to be a, a fairly uh, heavyweight compute. Uh, this is done through posting a message in a queue. So don't mind too much the architecture. Oh, and I have my admin app. Uh, don't mind too much the architecture. This is about you know, having lots of different services, some events, and having all the challenges that are described to, to deal with. Uh, so we'll come back to this uh, after some of you exercise the app, and if you don't, I'll, I'll do it. Um, all right, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about Google SREs. Who's heard of the term SRE before? Um, so SRE stands for um, Site Reliability Engineering, or Service Reliability Engineering. I guess the S is, is up for, for definition. Really, this is how we think about it. Uh, an SRE is Google's implementation of DevOps. Uh, DevOps is being defined in fairly abstract term. It's best practices. Uh, it's not a methodology. It's not something where you follow steps 1 through 10 and you're guaranteed to have amazing uh, operations. Um, there, there's some other implementations of SRE. Uh, I'm sorry, of DevOps, but SRE is Google's implementation. And you think DevOps, we, you say DevOps, we think SRE. It's, it's really important for us. It's a very highly regarded position at Google. We don't have that many of them. Uh, we have probably something like, for every one SRE, about 20 engineers, software engineers. Um, and, and the reason I mention that is, is that um, it has a few consequences in how we operate our services. Um, it also is a term that you start seeing in job descriptions, so uh, it, it's, it's probably something you will see and hear more of in, in the months and years to come. Um, we operate a number of services at scale. Most of you know them and, and, and might even use them. Uh, really, it all relies on the role of SREs. And, and SREs are, again, as I said, very highly regarded at Google. And there aren't that many of them, which means you really need to work well with them. And that all uh, comes uh, and starts with culture. Uh, the culture is something we've tried to convey in a book that was written uh, a couple of years ago, there's a second one that came out. The first one is available online. It's, it's free. And it's all about explaining why this is not about just carrying a pager and, and, and you know, going and putting out fires because some CPU went over 90%, some disk is full, something else happened. You're really trying to automate yourself out of the job. You're really trying to put observability right into the software as it's being built, not try to add this after the fact or rely on some you know, magic framework or product that you use. Um, to the extent that a, an SRE could say, look, your product you're about to launch, I am not good, going to be the SRE for this. Because I consider it to not be ready in terms of observability. 
I will not carry the pager for this. And, and SREs have that luxury at Google to say that, uh, which makes the relationship between software engineers, uh, their management, uh, their product managers, and SREs an interesting one, where you really have to prove yourself in terms of how uh, you have put all the right things in place so that you're able to actually operate at scale. Um, of course, you because you have, again, for one SRE, 20 engineers, the SRE cannot go and talk to the 20 people and say, please log that metric. Please expose that thing so I can look at it later. So they need to be on the opposite, quite uh, opinionated in the things that need to be there. Uh, so this is about uh, making sure we instrument services that all have names, services, uh, versions uh, that expose a number of things by default. Uh, it's, it's fairly op opinionated, uh, but that's the only way we can operate at that scale. Um, then we have a platform, which is really a, a time-based series database, where we log potentially amazing, amazingly huge amounts of data. And only then do we have tools that will show um, the result of all of this, you know, from culture to platform, with all the, the uh, very opinionated frameworks that we have in place in terms of uh, logging, tracing, and so forth. Um, Who's heard of SLA before? Everybody, like, okay. Who's heard of SLO before? Okay. So these are really important concepts. This is one way uh, the SRE comes to something um, that's really concrete. It's not just you know abstract things as I've been describing so forth. Um, the first thing that you want is to define SLIs or service level indicators. Uh, an indicator is. For example, the number of uh, requests that are being served with a 200x error, uh, or that are four or five hundreds. Um, the latency, uh, these are SLIs that are fairly technical. They could be more business oriented. You know, how many sales have I made? This is an SLI. This is something that actually matters to the end user. And then user will see something that's slow or that returns with an error. Um, a CPU that goes to 100% or 80%, because we've done the obvious thing of, of um, implementing auto-scaling, you know, it's not worth waking somebody up or paging somebody for this. It will fix itself. Uh, something that goes really wrong in terms of response time and trends the wrong way uh, is something you might need to wake somebody up or, or page somebody for. So SLI is those metrics that really matter to the end user. Uh, the SLO, and, and it has an impact on my business. The SLO is um, based on those SLI, an objective, a promise you're making to yourself. I want this many, this percentage of my requests to be served in less than a second or three milliseconds, if it's you know uh, what your goal is. Um, and that's really important because from there you can actually derive what we call an error budget. An error budget is we never set a, a goal of 100% uptime or 100% of anything at Google for any of our product, never. Uh, it's very high up. It's a good number of nines, but it's never 100%. And the reason for that is that uh, we want to be able to add new features. We want to be able to deploy new things. And uh, we might break things. Um, but we don't want to break things too horribly. So we define this notion of a budget that we can spend on deploying new things and potentially breaking stuff. Uh, we have all the practices to roll back, to do canary deployments, to do all sorts of things that if something does go bad, uh, we, we can you know, uh, roll back the, the problem and, and make it go away. But that notion of an error budget is really important. The SLA part, is not all that important, uh, at least not from the SRE standpoint. It's really the business version of an SLO. Typically, you have an SLO internally. That's a promise you make. And somebody will sell that service and will promise an SLA, which is not as aggressive, probably, as the SLO. You'll probably keep some, some buffer, because otherwise you start paying money uh, or, or there's some sort of consequence. Uh, but that's really a business term, and it's kind of outside the scope of SREs. Uh, as I mentioned, versioning is really important. When you have multiple services in the serverless world, uh, maybe a, a 
a, a, a build version will make all the way uh, if it goes through a number of tests and a promoted build version will make its way to a service running um, and, and be version there so that you can implement things like um, alpha deployments, beta testing. Um, and, and the idea is that they're all active, of course, at the same time. That's, that's really important. Um, and you can do this for a given service, not for the entire application. Uh, that was the whole point of breaking your application into smaller modules, is that you can scale and version independently so those different uh, modules. Uh, and that helps you implement things, as I was mentioning, canary deployments, blue-green deployments. Maybe I want just a percent of the traffic to go to uh, this new deployment. And I will look at the logs only for this deployment and gradually increase that 1% to 5 to 10 to eventually 100% if, if all goes well. Um, so these are practices we, we use all the time. Like, actually, we're probably never at 100% on a given service. We'll have, always have experiments or new things being rolled out. Um, so let me uh, talk about the tools a little bit. Uh, and le let me try to make the case for the fact that because we have this SRE mindset, again, looking at CPU utilization or even you know, disk space or or IOs, that type of thing, doesn't really matter because we've automated of all, all these things. We're, remember, in serverless, we're higher up the stack. Um, and, and yes, we, we still need tools. We still need to be able to look at logs and correlate things that might happen, have happened in different parts of your application. You probably need traces to understand how you know, one invocation triggered another one and how you ended up making this call. Um, you probably need, you know, error reporting. You know, there's a 500 error, there's a stack trace somewhere. It's been happening multiple times. Uh, th this is the type of thing that you want. But what you really want, I believe, is a way to monitor uh, your SLO. Uh, the SLO is what matters. Uh, this is what you should be monitoring. Again, the, SR the SLO is something that you can derive an error budget from. And the error budget is what you, as a team developing, both developing and operating, should be looking at at all time, pretty much. The moment you wake up an SRE or anybody on call is when that you know, uh, error budget is going down really quickly. The fact that it's going down is OK. You have a budget, and like any other budget, you should be using it. Because otherwise, you're not, you're not going to be given that budget again next time. And that translates into things like you get your users used to really, really high standards, uh, and that's not good. You don't want that. You want to set an SLO uh, that is as good as possible, but it cannot be 100%. So you get to decide, based on the, the thing you're building, what that should be. But the error budget is what you should have an eye on. So uh, let's see uh, maybe this a little bit in action. Uh, so this is the app uh, that uh, has been building. Has anybody posted anything? Maybe not, so I'll, I guess I'll have to post a picture of myself. Uh, that is always very awkward. Uh, but eventually, this will uh, make its way into a bucket. We'll call an API, and something will come up about some senior citizen looking at a screen here. Um, I, I sometimes get that. Um, um, I do have an admin, so I can filter things out. Uh, I can see why th some things were flagged as maybe not being appropriate. Um, this was thought to be violent. Uh, this was just my dessert last time. Uh, but you know, I, I'd rather see this in, in, that, in, that, um, in that list here rather than see really horrible things make, make their way to the public website. Uh, but I did deploy a new version uh, right before I started. So maybe I, I did something wrong there. Uh, in particular, as I post things, you know, things seem to be a little slow. See, the picture is still not here. So let me look at, um, at traces. So traces are, for a given call, you know, what are the calls that have been made? Um, and, and this is interesting because in this case here, I see a lot of those have taken, uh, you know, on average three milliseconds when most of the others have been clustered here around um, a second. So. Typically, uh, there might be something wrong. Um, and I can see and, and look at the URL that was called and how long it took. And that seems awfully long for what it's doing. Um, and 
By the way, I got an email fairly recently that said an error that was resolved previously reoccurred. So let me click on this. And in this case, um, I should be pointed to um, that error that just reoccurred. And that might be linked to the deployment that I did recently. Um, and that thing uh, actually is not the one I was looking for. Let me go and look at another one. Uh, there he is. Oh, you know, let me trigger this, actually. Uh, that would be even better. Uh, if we go to the tags, the most popular tags, if I click on one of those, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, not really good. Probably not helping my, my, my error budget as, as we speak. So um, here, um, oh, look what just happened. Uh, an exception, a 500 exception, it's called I'm a fake exception. Hmm, I wonder what ha what's going on here. Oh. Uh, this is probably code that I've written. Uh, I was trying to trigger some stuff, so it shows in the in the in the UI. So let me just go back, and yeah, all the traffic is going to this version called Bogus. Uh, it's probably a good way to a good thing to actually migrate the traffic back uh, to this previous one. Um, traffic splitting, or being able to send all the traffic to one version or to the other, is really key to the way we operate. Very um, smoothly, I would say, in, very, uh, in a very agile way. But all of this is nice. And yes, I have logs. And yes, I could see all the logs across all um, the different modules that I have. But what really matters is this. Um, that's my SLO. Uh, and I define, in this case, an SLO that, needs the, that says that 95% uh, percentile of my uh, requests should respond in less than two seconds. And remember those three seconds? Well, clearly I am not meeting that SLO, uh, especially in the last few minutes. Um, I am recovering though because, you know, s probably I rolled back or something has happened and or people have stopped using the service and and, and since this is defined, by the way, uh, on a rolling one-day basis, could be a week, could be a month, uh, I am recovering. But you know what? My error budget, uh, I'm out of error budget. So it's probably a good time to work on the reliability of my system and stop deploying new features. That's certainly how we operate. We have a whole set of colors to, def to declare a code yellow, a code orange, red, what have you, on how severe a problem is and how we need to go back and fix the availability of a system. Uh, so uh, monitor your SLO. That would be the most important thing. And then from there, you can drill down and try to understand what happens. Have you had errors? Have you had latency issues? Can you trace down the problem from uh, one call to the others? And so uh, in closing, let me just um, restate a couple of things. Uh, no ops is not a good term. Uh, don't use it. Uh, you will uh, alienate all the, the ops people. Um, um, serverless and microservices clearly come with unique challenges when it comes to operations. So you need to take those into account. And, and you need, again, a number of things that we've implemented as SREs. There are probably other ways to implement this. It's not the only right way. It, it has worked for us. It's working for our customers. Um, and you need the culture. You need the infrastructure, the opinionated frameworks, and you do need some tools at some point. But the tools without everything else, including the culture and the SREs, uh, are not all that useless. Let me leave you with a few resources. There are two books on SREs that have been uh, written. The first one is free online, um, and the second one just came out. Or just Google for SRE book, and, and you'll find it. Or use your favorite search engine. And there's a series of videos that compare and contrast, actually, DevOps and SRE. And I think it's a great series of really short uh, videos that you should look at. And with that, I think I'm out of time. I hope this was useful to you. Um, and uh, uh, since we are out of time, yes, we are, uh, please come to me if you have questions. Uh, I'll be happy to answer those. And I'll leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much.